Good morning and welcome to this, the 11th meeting of the Equality and Human Rights Committee. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones are put onto silent or on airplane mode? Um, and moving on uh, to our first agenda item this morning is a decision to take item four in private. Our committee agreed to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so moving on to a substantive item this morning, agenda item two, is the departure of the UK from the European Union and the implications for equalities and human rights. And with us this morning, we have Professor Ali Watson, who is Executive Director of the Third Generation Project based at St Andrews University. We'll be keen to hear about that project, Ali. Um, and Craig Wilson, the Public Affairs and Parliamentary Officer with the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations. Thank you so much for coming to committee this morning and uh, any evidence that you've provided to us so far. We have a very deep pile of papers with us this week, um, so we thank you for that. It's very informative and very helpful in our uh, investigations. Um, you'll understand that the, this committee has obviously got a, a line of sight on equalities in, in human rights and the impact of any withdrawal from the, the European Union and the negotiations ongoing. So this is something that we'll tap into as the negotiations on, on, on go. So this is... Uh, this morning is, is another example of us, us doing this. Our focus this morning is the third sector uh, and the work that, that they do and the impact that, that, that Brexit could have on, on the third sector. So we're really keen, uh, Craig, to hear from you this morning and your organisation. We see that you conducted a survey um, of the organisations that, that fall within um, your uh, gambit and we're really keen to hear about that and maybe some of the other factors that would have that Brexit would have an impact on the work that you do and then Ali if you can come in after that. Greg. Um, yeah well uh, since uh, Brexit obviously everyone's been in the same boat we really don't know very much about what's happening at all so our first action was to, to call together meetings of, of our members to try and gauge their concerns and, and to throw ideas around and, and see if we could pin down some of the, the risks and uh, any potential opportunities that there might be. Um, we had roundtable meetings with Scottish Government Ministers, with UK Government Ministers as well, um, and we do an, an annual state of the survey, state of the sector survey, um, which brings in about 400 responses each year. This year, um, as a result of the vote to leave the EU, we included a separate section on, on the, on Brexit and, and some of the risks that, that people perceived might be coming down the line. So um, just to briefly recap some of the stuff that's in, in that survey, um, around 86% of our members felt that uh, leaving the EU would have a negative impact on the Scottish economy. 81% felt it would have a negative impact on poverty and social exclusion. Um, specific to this committee, 80% felt it would have a negative impact on human rights and equalities. Um, so generally, the, I mean, the feeling was strong in the sector that the, the EU had generally been good uh, for, for policy priorities uh, in Scotland that related to the third sector. Um, and just at the bottom there, um, third sector organisations partner up with um, other third sector organisations across Europe. They build networks, they learn from them, they secure funding together. So the strength of the sector overall uh, is impacted by uh, the European Union. Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, <clears throat> Ali, do you want to tell us a wee bit about the project that you're working on in St Andrews and maybe give us some responses uh, and, and the thoughts that, that, that you've been working on? Sure, yeah, because I, I think it'd be quite nice just to put in context, um, you know, what, what we do and, and, and where we're coming from as well with the with the Brexit um, debate. So, you know, first of all, I'd like to, to thank the, co the, co the committee for giving the, the third generation project the opportunity to, to contribute to the, the evidence being presented here today. Um, we are basically an independent think tank um, that's based at the University of St Andrews. And what we aim to do in our work is to further human rights institutions and cultures. So we welcome, of course, the, the work of the committee um, and especially your, your consideration of the impact of um, Brexit on human rights, because really, I mean, this is an area that we think there just needs to be a whole lot more discussion um, on. So, I mean, just to, to give you a bit of, of background, because I, um, I think what we're doing is looking at Brexit and, and human rights from um, from really quite a wide perspective, um, you know, from an international and a UK and um, and and Scotland, um, and we're looking specifically at how human rights, both individual and collective, are understood in Scotland and across the world, and how those understandings are adapting to this political landscape, which is very. Um, 
which is very, there's a lot of unhe upheaval and things um, at the moment. So, I mean, today what I'd like to do actually um, is focus on the collective rights implications of, um, of Brexit. Um, and just before I go on, I should clarify that um, when, I, when I differentiate between individual and collective rights, I'm really referring to the idea that there are three dimensions of, of, of human rights. The first um, dimension being civil and political, and the second, um, economic and structural, and then um, the, the third um, dimension of collective rights, those rights that can be interpreted as rights that are held by certain groups, either groups that are perhaps marginalised or minority groups, and also uh, rights that are held by all of us um, that access collective commons such as water and food and, and our environment. So you know, there's, a, there's a direct crossover between um, what we're looking at in terms of some of the work on marginalism and minority groups and the kind of work that, um, that, that Craig's doing um, as well. And basically we're focusing, I, I suppose, I mean, you've seen, you've seen the evidence submission. I'd probably quite like to focus on the human rights implications of, um, of climate change. Um, and I think it's important to look at that because it's fair to say that that's one area that has received scant attention so far in Brexit discussions. So there's no mention of climate, for example, in the letter that triggered Brexit, or indeed there's no, there's no mention of human rights as you know, that phrase, human rights. Um, in the UK, environmental policy is closely linked to EU policy, and so Brexit will affect almost everything, every part of the UK's environmental policy. And that policy anyway has been heavily influenced by Europe. So Brexit will require that measures already in place are safeguarded under the, the Great Repeal Bill, but that will only aim at preserving the status quo um, when much more um, is needed. And I think there's some, there are some opportunities. I think it's important to think about opportunities as well within Brexit, because given that, that it's happening, we have, to, we have to think about how we work um, within that. And I think within a Scottish context, Scotland already has a strong focus on environmental policy, and there's been a lot of, of effort put into securing Scotland's resources, but we're not protected from that wider geography of, of climate change. And so having a place within the European Union um, gave the UK a place at the table in environmental negotiations. Um, and that, that's something that, um, that obviously um, that, that they will no longer um, have. I think what's important as well to say from the Scottish um, context as well is that yeah, I just want to be clear that there are human rights implications of, of environmental policy, both within a Scot Scottish context, but also the UK and, and an international context as well. So, you know, for example, um, one of the things that we could consider and think about is geopolitical instability. So um, climate change can be referred to as a threat multiplier. So it creates instability and it worsens it if it already exists. Um, another is displacement. As a result of climate change, large numbers of people are, are, are already being displaced. And there's estimates already that that displacement is going to far exceed anything that, that we're seeing at the moment with the, with the current refugee crisis. And so, you know, really, um, you know, for us as well, we're thinking about how climate change, for example, has an impact on food security and, and on water rights. And if it seems like all of those things are happening, you know, sort of very much elsewhere, I think um, one other point to consider is what addressing those issues head on would, um, would do in terms, for example, of job creation, um, possibility for increased research and, um, and innovation. So, you know, what we're doing at, um, at the Third Generation Project is thinking about these human rights concerns about um, climate change, um, but thinking as well what the opportunities are, I guess. Okay. I'm going to go to some opening questions and I'm coming to Gail Ross first. Okay. Um, thank you, Convener. I do have um, a couple of questions for ACVO, but I wanted to, 
to go along that line that um, Professor Ollie Watson started with, the, the climate change. I mean, obviously in Scotland, we have our own very ambitious climate change targets, and we have hit the, the previous ones six years earlier, uh, six years early, sorry. Are there any particular EU policies that you think are under threat? And how, how easy or difficult would it be to incorporate those into Scots law? Um, I'm not a lawyer, I should, no, I should, it's, I should I, say I'm that. Sure. And, and a lot is, is, still, um, is still up in the air, of course. But I think, um, I mean, I think it's important, first of all, when we talk about Scotland's policy and how ambitious that is, to see actually that when we're talking about um, the Great Repeal Bill and things almost just being sort of transferred, there's a, a, there's a tendency to think of that policy as almost being the floor of, of, of where we could potentially go. Um, and I think what, what Scotland already has um, highlighted is that it actually could go much, much further. And there's a, there's a great quote about, you know, that, that you know, we're talking about a floor, but actually we should be thinking about a ceiling, you know. Um, and so I think, you know, in terms of, um, of climate change policies, you know, in, in particular, um, you know, I think, um, I mean, for us, it's really important to just think about, um, to think about the human rights implications, to think about the, the, the rights Framework. So, you know, for example, to to ensure that um, you know that water quality is, is maintained, to make sure that if um, you know the policies that come back, if they do come back in terms of agriculture and fisheries, if they, if some of those at least come back to Scotland, that those that those are done again with that idea of um, of moving forward. And I think you know we have to see as well environmental policy as not just not just you know, carbon emissions and things, but also as well as you know, fisheries, agriculture, um, the way that land is managed, the way that water is managed. Um, and those things previously and, and now are things that Scotland is and has been leading in. And I think it's important to, to keep that um, and to, to maintain that position. The difficulty is that, that given that you've got the UK negotiating um, you know, at the moment, um, as, a, as an EU member and having this position in the EU, the, the worry is that not only are the policies weakened within a UK context, but within a European context as well, because you don't have the UK there, that that actually becomes problematic. And so then that you, you've got Scotland sort of slightly, you know, swimming amongst this, um, this sort of sea of policies that aren't moving forward as quickly as they, as they could. Um, we are. Uh, we do have on our programme. We're going to be legislating for a good food nation bill, and part of that is going to be uh, food security and mm -hmm. environmental impacts and things mm -hmm. like that. Do you think that that's something that we could focus on in, in respect of what you were just talking about? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I think food security is just vitally important, whether whether it's a national context, whether it's looking in terms of I mean, some of the the research that that, that we do is working with with communities that are dealing with land rights issues um, and food security issues that, that arise as a result. And you know, the, the, the significance of that in human rights terms just can't be, can't be underestimated. But you know, I, think, I think there is a tendency to think well, you know, human rights is, is this, and you know, land rights and environment and climate change and you know, development are something else, and, and the two are just increasingly interlinked. OK, that's a good point. Um, Craig Wilson, um, good morning. I was interested um, in your survey and you opened by, by speaking about that. Um, in your opinion, what parts of your sector do you think will face the biggest challenges from Brexit? Probably, I mean, across the board, funding is a, is a, huge, uh, is a huge issue. So we're not quite sure yet how that's going to pan out. And it's something that all of our members are, are concerned about. I think in terms of the aims of particular third sector organisations. I think the organisations that tackle poverty and deal with the symptoms of, of poverty will probably find that if there is an economic shock, as people are predicting, or as if inflation increases, um, those organisations will find an increased demand for their services. Um, that represents something of a, of a perfect storm, because if their funding is cut or reduces at the same time, 
that demand for their services increases, um, that will cause real problems for them. So certainly um, organisations that, that tackle poverty are the ones that are most likely to, in the short term or the medium term, see an, up, an uptake in their services at a time where funding um, is uncertain for them. Yeah, I do find it rather ironic that Brexit is likely to increase the need for advocacy and charity services at a time where um, the, the funding will be going down. Um, the Chancellor has pledged to underwrite EU-funded projects that are signed off before Britain leaves the EU, um, but his guarantees are not backed up by any legislation or any kind of formal policy. Um, but they've also stated, on the other hand, that they will only honour or replace EU funding for projects that are judged to be, and I quote, good value for money, or again, quote, in line with domestic strategic priorities. Do you think that's a good way to distribute funding? I mean, the, the, the first thing that should be said is it's great that he's underwritten up until uh, the UK leaves the EU. That, that has given some certainty to, to our members who were just you know, in shock the, the day after the vote. Um, in terms of, of going forward, it would seem that the, the UK and potentially Scotland will have to establish their own funding streams for future delivery of, of uh, charitable funding or for st strategic funding. Um, we're not quite sure how that's going to work yet. We don't know if this is going to be done at a UK level or if money will come to the UK and then be barneted back to Scotland and then Scotland will have its own uh, priorities. Um, certainly that would seem sensible because you can then target w what specific needs you have. Um, the, the moment under the 2014 to 2020 um, funding structures, uh, the third sector has been able to tap in to funding for very specific things. That includes employability pipelines, social inclusion and poverty reduction and growing the social economy. So to tap into that funding, you have to have very specific aims and that funding is there for that purpose. If it's going to be as vague as in line with uh, domestic priorities or good causes, then that will be a worry to people because that's capricious and it could be up to the government of the day to decide what those priorities are. Um, so certainly, any new funding system, whether it's at UK level or a Scottish level, we would hope would continue to have specific aims and ambitions which the third sector could then uh, lend itself to. Um, you, you mentioned funding from project to project, and obviously we all know that following um, the financial crisis in 2008, there were a lot fewer grants available to um, charitable organisations. So a lot of these organisations have no reserves and they rely on project to project funding. What advice are you giving these organisations? Um, they're relying on reserves and they're drawing on reserves as well um, to, to keep going uh, in many cases. Um, there's very little advice we can give at the moment because the money's money and if it's not there then it's not there. Um, so we are struggling to, to give advice in that regard. I mean SCVO runs a, a funding advice line, which charities are always welcome to, to call for assistance, and we can try and perhaps point them to funding that they weren't aware of in, in the past. But really, this is just something that we have to get to grips with, and, and hopefully, when the new funding streams are in place, we have to hit the ground running, because at the moment, European funding isn't perfect. It, it's like turning an oil tanker around. It's very hard to get these things off the ground and up and running. Um, so, so we would hope that serious consideration is given to what funding is going to look like in the future and make sure that it starts um, on time and as it means to go on. Um, do you see any particular challenges for charities in the third sector in rural areas? Um, from what we can gather, the, the leader fund um, is particularly important to rural areas um, and as a generality, rural areas get a greater percentage share of, of funding from, from Europe. So certainly any shortfall or any reduction is, is going to disproportionately hit rural areas, we would, we would anticipate. Um, and just one more. <laughs> Sorry. Um, do you think that the voluntary sector can have any influence over the Brexit process? 
as I mentioned at the start, we've, had, we've been engaging with the Scottish Government and uh, the UK Government as well. We had Lord Dunlop um, from the Scotland office visit us um, quite early on uh, after the vote. So we've been bending anyone's ear that will that will listen. Um, what we've kind of agreed amongst ourselves, amongst our members, is that the, the debate was becoming very arid, um, very focused on the economy, on jobs and agriculture, and those things are hugely important, there's no doubt about it, but we felt that as that went on, people were maybe starting to switch off and they were missing perhaps the, the bigger picture of what, what Europe is about, and it's about you know, solidarity between European nations, about networks between third sector organisations, it's about human rights, it's about freedom to move about, it's about people, essentially. Um, so we're, we've been trying quite hard to inject that back into the debate to, to offer a, a bigger picture of, of what Europe actually means and, and hopefully um, make people aware of, of what might be at stake. Okay. I do have... I'll give other people a chance. <laughs> well, we'll see if we have time at the end then. <laughs> Alex Cole Hamilton. Well, I've not quite done my homework in the way that Gail Ross has, but welcome to the panel. I do have a couple of questions for you. Um, firstly, in respect of the human rights environment that we will find ourselves um, if and when we leave the European Union. I say if because my party is still fighting very hard to keep the United Kingdom in the European Union. Um, but nevertheless, if, if that is the trajectory that we are on. Um, now, obviously, the Great Repeal Bill will protect our... Um, well will continue our observance of certain treaties and rights that we have um, adopted through our membership of the European Union. Um, but obviously, then, after that, it's really up to us to continue the progress in terms of uh, rights. And I wonder if the panel could reflect on what Scotland can do, particularly with regards to incorporation, and certainly from um, my perspective, the incorporation of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child for, into Scots law is something we've been working hard to convince the government of. Um, but in the Brexit context, where are the other gaps? What are the other things that we should do as low-hanging fruit, easy wins in terms of our progress in that um, human rights uh, agenda? <laughs> okay, um, yeah, I, I think I would like to, to start, first of all, by saying I think, I think one, one area that I see actually as an opportunity um, because, as well, it's, it, it, it's quite a gap, is to actually um, identify... I mean, at the moment, we're talking a lot about economics and security within the Brexit context. Um, and I actually think that, for example, in economic terms, it's necessary to continually highlight the importance of human rights in trade policy. Because, you know, for example, when... When the UK negotiates, you know, if, if Brexit happens and the UK negotiates um, a, a trade deal with the European Union, the European Union is anyway sitting with all, with all those rights that it has at, at the moment and wants, wants its trading partners to, to adhere to those rights um, as well. And so I think in economic terms, it's just necessary to continually highlight the the benefits, actually, of, of human rights to, um, to trade policy, because I think if we don't do that, then it becomes, um, you know, the possible consideration of, um, of taking, you know, of having cheaper labour, taking rights away, you know, sort of not, not sort of always constantly moving the goal, the, the goals sort of forward. Um, and it's really important that we don't that we ensure that individual and collective rights don't lose traction as a result of um, Brexit. So I think what that does is opens up uh, a space for a much more um, visible championing of, of human rights in trade policy. And I think as well that that then could form the basis of, of future policy leadership. It's, it's saying it's a different, it's a different type of of trade policy, it's one that's that's mindful, you know, of of the wider term, the the wider scale human rights um, implications. Because you know, in both economics and security security terms, you know, these these issues that you know maybe traditionally were, were sort of soft politics issues or seen as soft politics issues, have hard politics implications if they're not um, if they're not addressed. So I, I think I think given that that there is a tremendous amount of political will in terms of 
the economic and security dimensions, but there's not so much mentioned about the human rights dimensions. One way to push human rights forward is, is within that particular context. Thank you. Craig, do you have anything to offer on that? Yeah, I mean, very briefly at the start, I mean, the, the, the Great Repeal Bill and the, and the transferring of, of European legislation over into the UK statute books is, on the face of it, excellent. And, and that's a great starting point. It gives people um, some peace of mind. But we're quite cautious about how those fit into UK legislation and also the use of statutory instruments and so-called Henry VIII clauses to do that. There is a risk that, as, as this is done en masse, which is what it will be, that will be, it'll be thousands of statutory instruments, there is a risk that the letter of the law is not quite remembered, it's tr translated in a different way, that there are accidental um, changes or, you know, hopefully not, but deliberate uh, changes to those to those pieces of legislation. So that's something we want people to be very vigilant about. Um, it'll be difficult because it's, it's monumental, uh, the, the amount of legislation that we're talking about. Um, in terms of what Scotland can do, um, you know, I'm not a lawyer either. I don't know exactly um, what is devolved and what isn't and how, uh, how these things work. But I understand that as procurement law is um, sort of freed from EU legislation, there may be opportunities there to build in more equalities um, aspects to them that would maybe encourage you know more disabled people to be employed or whatever those might be it might be something that is worth looking at to, to improve procurement um, essentially to, to ratify as much into Scots law as possible that we, th we think is good if, if it is doable then I think that's certainly something that should be done um, and, and also the, the role of the Parliament to bring rights into focus. One of the, the byproducts of, of the Brexit vote is that we're now talking about these things. Um, you know, since the ECHR in the 50s, human rights have almost been taken for granted in some respects. And this is an opportunity for, for us all to, to look at what's important to us and, and to safeguard against any potential regression. Thank you. Um, I mentioned the uh, United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and our desire to see that incorporated into Scotland's <coughs> law because without it, children don't have access to justiceability of their rights. There's no recourse to justice if their rights are impinged upon uh, under the terms of that treaty. And that's why I think you know we need to take um, legislation in this country still further beyond part one of the Children and Young People Act, which just gives a, a duty on ministers to raise awareness of the UNCRC <coughs> rather than do anything which will bring about justiceability. So access to Justice is absolutely crucial in terms of making rights real, because without, uh, without recourse to justice, without um, testing those rights in court, um, they are meaningless. They're, they're not worth the paper they are written on. Um, now, I, as I understand it, we will still have access to the European Court of Human Rights, even though we are potentially leaving the European Union. But can the panel reflect on the risks to our access to justice in that sort of estrangement from the wider European continent, albeit not physically, um, in terms of that, that crucial access to justice and making those rights real? Yeah, I think um, one of the, the, the risks is not only do we lose the, the protections potentially that, that we have through the, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, but it's the oversight, it's the idea that there is another court that you can go to. It's a great leveller between citizens and their own state that if they feel they've been wronged, they can appeal to a higher a higher power. So in that sense, it's, it's a, a, a loss. Um, SCVO contributed to the British Institute for Human Rights report um, to the UN. Um, um, which looked at the state of human rights in the UK, and, and it wasn't great. I mean, Scotland wasn't great either. There were certain areas, for example, the um, uh, criminal age for children is, is still very low in Scotland. There are lots of problems, but there were areas where there was regression already happening uh, as part of the, the EU, and one of them was an access to justice, and it was changes to legal aid and people's ability to, to go to court and, and to seek justice. So certainly <laughs> there are concerns that the, the trajectory is not already good, <clears throat> but the, the oversight and the checks and balances that other courts outside the UK and Scotland provide will also be lost. 
I mean, if I could just say as well, I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I agree with, with, with Craig, that idea of, of oversight and monitoring, I think, is, is very important. I think it's important, too, to look, to look at those instruments that exist and like the UN Convention. Um, and also, actually, to, to, and then to think about um, sometimes even the efficacy of, of those. Um, and whether actually um, they necessarily do all that they can do. I mean, what they do is provide international standards. But if you look, you know, within a European context, you know, something like the the age of criminal responsibility, you know, changes wherever you wherever you go in in, in Europe. So there's a there's there's a different view of childhood and of children, you know, across um, across Europe. That I think um, that you know, I think it is it, it's quite important to. Um, you know, to, to consider because there there isn't a standardisation of law with regard to children in the European Union, you know, anyway, um, and so um, and also you know with regard to um, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, I mean, it, it's very very important that 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 instrument is there, that 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 um, document is is there, um, and you know, it's the most widely ratified, as you know, um, piece of human rights legislation. Um, that exists, but but that doesn't stop the fact that you know that you've got child labour um, still existing, that you've got the worst forms of child labour still existing, um, that you know under under Article 12, you know that um, that children's voices are meant to be heard more in decision making processes, and they're and they're really not particularly, except in particular um, contexts. And some countries are much better um, than this. Than this, to others, you know, and as well, you know, the idea even about, you know, the universality of, of age in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. You know, that a child is everyone up till the age of 18. Well, you know, in human rights terms, what what do you do if you know if you're a if you're a 16 year old who's in charge of the family and needs to actually access land rights? It's very very difficult, and you know, there is. There is a sort of view of children, I think, that comes from the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child that. You know that, that you know is is somewhat idealistic, but I don't think it's wrong for for doing that. You know that that actually, in some senses, there's a there's a notion that you can give back um, a childhood to, to to a child who has you know suffered a large amount of abuse, and and you know really what you can do is is um, you know is, is is help them deal with that but not actually give anything back you know so so i think it's it's important to see as well the uncrc as as a global standard um but also a, a comparatively a, a flawed document about which there is an awful lot of discussion as well within academic circles um and and elsewhere um about what it actually restricts in addition to what it actually um, allows to, to go forward. And then within that context, to think, OK, so within, um, within Scotland and the UK, you know, what can we do about the age of criminal responsibility? What, what should it be? Um, and what does it say about our view of childhood, of, of where, we, where we set that age of criminal responsibility? I think it's important as well. Thank you both very much. And for the record, convener, I should remind members of my uh, register of interest in that I was previously the uh, convener of the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights. Can I just pick up a point, uh, uh, Craig Wilson, on something that you said, and, and it was on the, the question from Alec O'Hamlin on recourse to justice and where you go for that. Now, I know a number of the organisations that fall within um, SEVO uh, that provide advice, guidance and support in order for people to access um, their rights and uh, to, to seek re recourse through the justice system. If you've not got EU funding for those projects and that's not been forthcoming from the Chancellor, what happens to those people when they're seeking that justice? It depends if they, I mean, some of these organisations will receive EU funding, some won't. Some, will, some of it will be guaranteed up until, uh, the, for anything that's signed, I understand, before the UK leaves the, the EU. So there's no immediate threat. Um, what we have to do, though, is with any funding, any monies that come back, as it is, um, that has to be fed into a funding stream that allows that to continue. Um, if that's at a Scottish level, then the same priorities should continue to be met. If it's at a, a UK level and it's as vague as good causes, then that could be a concern because that's open to interpretation. 
Um, in terms of whether they have that funding or not, if, if they don't have it, then they can't do their job. Um, they won't be able to signpost people in the way that they, they did in the past. So it's really important to, to make sure that, that the funding is sustained. OK, th thanks very much. Um, Mary Fee. Thank you, um, convener, and good morning. <coughs> Excuse me. I suppose I wanted to further explore the issue of, of, of funding, and I know we've, we've concentrated quite heavily on that, but I think that's one of the, the key issues for the third sector organisations um, as, as we leave Brexit is, is the issue of, of funding. And if we look at um, third sector organisations, I, I suppose many of them have their core function, but third sector organisations are usually very, very inventive in, in the way they use their funding to ensure that they go... 100% of the time, usually above and beyond um, what they're required to do. And I suppose my question, Craig, is, is specifically for you. And, and what is the, the level, or have you assessed the level of unrest amongst third sector organisations, of how much of their, their whole package they'll need to pull back? Um, and will they be left with just the core service that they provide, um, that, that they get funding for? Certainly, there is there is unrest, and um, more or, some organisations more than others rely on EU funding. So there'll be mm -hmm. some that actually receive very little, or maybe none mm -hmm. at all. So um, they're more concerned about the economic impact and what that means for demand. And you know, if they're mm -hmm. already stretched, then that makes things harder. Organisations that rely on EU funding as a as a, a core sort of element of of their of what they provide are, are obviously concerned. It's very very hard to to pin down who gets what um, mm. and through what mechanism, because you get money uh, that comes via the Scottish Government, some that comes direct from the European Commission, and then you also get uh, organisations that, sister organisations across Europe partner up and they bid for funding together. And we don't really, it's almost impossible to keep track of. So to give an, a straight answer about what the overall impact would be in terms of mm. any lost funding is, it's nigh on impossible, I'm afraid. Yeah. And, and I suppose the, the, the other area of concern, while we've been given <clears throat> a degree of guarantee that the funding will, will, will carry <clears throat> on, and there's been an assurance given that the, will, the funding will be matched, <clears throat> when third sector organisations are planning what they do, the current way that the funding system works, um, there is almost a kind of confidence that funding will, will, will be given to them so they can carry on with their services. Is there a concern that they will have to, to stop supporting people or stop providing services that would normally just carry on as each funding period um, comes round and that people will actually fall through the gap? Mm. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, <clears throat> security and stability for the organisation itself allows them to, to <coughs> forward plan. Um, so I think at the moment... From the, the, the survey that I mentioned was part of a wider survey, and I, I can forward this on to you later on, and it gives the, the sense of confidence within the third sector, and it's not great. Um, the, there's uncertainty, so it's a time of uncertainty, so that, that makes sense. But what, what it seems is that charities have gone into a sort of survival mode. They're not developing new projects. They're not... Uh, innovating in the way that we know they can. They're just trying to shore things up yeah. and make mm. sure that they survive. <coughs> and there's, there's general confidence that they can do that, but that's not getting the best out of the mm. sector. Um, so, yeah, there's, there is a sort of a freeze frame moment where it's we have to wait and see what's, what's going to come mm. next. Okay. Can, can I move on now and ask you about um, the role that um, the EU have played in terms of violence against women and, and human trafficking? Um, because a huge amount of work has been done um, and, and has filtered down around um, violence against women, and particularly human trafficking and information sharing. Um, what do you see as the, the, the impact of, of Brexit and all of that? It's, it's not an area I'm, I'm particularly expert and I have to say um, one of the concerns we have is for example about the Istanbul Convention mm -hmm. and, and making sure that that's, that's ratified. At the moment the UK have signed it but they haven't yet ratified it um, so we understand that that's progressing through uh, Westminster at the moment and mm. you know sooner rather than later would be great if, if that can be done so 
that kind of leads to a, it's a slightly wider point, but the idea that the, U, the EU is set up to take on these, these conventions, international conventions, mm. that it can absorb quite easily and through a, a set framework um, is, you know, has been hugely successful in the past. And we would like to see the, that the UK is able to adapt to these things in, in the way it has as a member of the, of the EU. Mm. So areas along those lines, international conventions mm -hmm. um, and, and our adherence to them is something we're really keen to see continue. Yeah. Ali, did you maybe want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in this area either, but I think one, one thing I would say is that, um, <coughs> I mean, f for me, I, you know, the, the, I would see this really as, you know, when, when you don't have um, adequate laws to really um, protect vulnerable groups um, you know so yes individual rights are, are absolutely crucial but you know collective rights as well to um, to protect vulnerable groups then those vulnerable groups as well then become vulnerable to other forms of, of human rights abuse so you know for for me I just I, I just think it's very important to um, to to remember that um, you know that when when you see you know, human trafficking, for example, that as, as well, that's that's the end result of, you know, of, of something before that and something before that and something before that. And, you know, where it might seem at times um, difficult to think exactly um, where the rights regime can operate within that particular um, context, thinking and monitoring that, that rights regime right the way along so that um, so that vulnerable groups don't become even more vulnerable, I think, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Jeremy Buffer. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for coming along. Um, I suppose to, show, uh, to declare that for the last 10 years I've worked in the third sector, both um, employment and also as a, a director of number third sector charities, which I still am. Um, I suppose I'm slightly concerned that we're hearing a narrative here today which maybe lacks evidence, or we're presuming things that everything is linked to Brexit, and that is the reason that these things are happening. And I suppose I've got a few questions, but I just want to come back to you, Craig, on one point you raised already, and that was in regard to legal aid and the entitlement to legal aid. That, was a, that, that, that had been a decision made by the Scottish Parliament's government. What's the link with Brexit to whether people get legal aid or not, but that has been an issue since I was in private practice 25 years ago, which was way before Brexit. So, so I'm just trying to work out what's your link between Brexit and entitlement to legal aid, which is a, a decision that has been made by this parliament. I think it's um, the point I was trying to make was that, that human rights are, even as part of the, the European Union, are not perfect in this country. And if there is a trajectory uh, moving in a direction away from a progressive approach, then that's of concern. The, the issue is that as you lose layers of oversight and uh, the ability to challenge these sorts of decisions, that situation can actually become worse because uh, as, as you whittle things down, um, governments become freer to do what they want with less challenges to them. So it was a, it was a point, a general point about uh, the loss of oversight. I mean, again, I just think we have to be careful that we don't link Brexit to that issue of civil legal aid, which I think was, you know, just if there is no evidential link between Brexit and whether people or people are entitled or not entitled no, no, to, no. To, to legal aid. And I, I think that's just challenging that point that you made, that you seem to make that presumption, which I think is the, the we've got to be careful on. The only reason I brought that up was because it was in the British Institute for Human Rights. Uh, report to the United Nations periodic review on human rights. It was a specific example where they had said there had been regression, and I was just making the point that there, there can be regression even as part of uh, the, the, the European Union. And I was just suggesting that if oversight was lost, then these, these things become easier. But I take your point that it's not directly linked to, to Brexit. Uh, just a couple of questions if I can. I, I mean, I think it, it, it's interesting people you've produced. Um, how many people replied to your survey? 400. Out of 1,400, is that? Uh, SIBO's membership is about uh, 1,500. Yeah. yeah. And 
of that, would you say the majority that responded were bigger charities, smaller charities, or was that a fair mix? I actually don't have the breakdown of that, but I could probably I could find that out for you and, and let you know. But it was it was a, a survey that ran for a, a couple of months, and we just encouraged responses from charities, big and small, to get the the widest possible picture. I mean, I wonder if it would be interesting, it, just in general, just to see the questions that were asked, and also who, without necessarily naming specific charities, can we may well be data protection on that, but just to know what type of charities did respond to this. Yeah. If that could be, be helpful. Yeah, I can look um, this is a question from ignorance, and again, it may be something you don't know off the top of your head. Uh, how many of your members at present receive European funding? <laughs> it's, um, I'm really, I'm not sure, actually. Um, it's, the third sector's quite slippery in terms of getting people to respond to things, and we don't have the, the sort of central resources like say the NHS who can rhyme stats off quite easily. We have to act in a way, for example, surveys um, to try and collect as much information as we possibly can. Um, so it is quite difficult. I mean, we know that um, about 40% of, of Scottish charities have had a partnership with European organisations, um, either at the moment or in the recent past. So at least 40% will have had some sort of uh, EU funding through uh, networks that they've established on their own. Then there'll be um, money that comes directly through the, the funding stream. So I, I couldn't give you a, a figure, but we're, we're talking at, le at least 40%, I would think. Uh, and again, uh, uh, you, again, it's probably an unfair question because you, it may not be something you know. But again, would that predominantly be larger charities who have those partnerships? Or is it again across the sector, or is it predominantly what we would call the kind of bigger, larger charities that have those relationships? Again, I think I think all charities are are, are bidding for for um, funding, and it will be the larger charities will be bidding for you know tens of thousands of pounds, and small community organisations will benefit from, uh, for example, the the leader fund that I mentioned to, to Gail Ross. Um, so it's, it's really, it's across the board, and it's, again, quite hard to pin down, but certainly I'll take all this back and find out what I can for you. Okay, thank you. I think maybe for an information point as well, whilst the, in the previous session when the Europe Committee attempted to map uh, funding across Scotland, it proved to be very, very difficult because there's so many avenues in which you can attract that funding. So uh, we, we commiserate with you because we attempted to do it over five years and it was very difficult. Um, and if you can do it, then tell us how you've done it, please. Uh, that would be very helpful indeed. Is, uh, Ali, I don't know if you want to come in in the back of any, any of Jeremy's questions because we're specific at at the, um, the survey, mm -hmm. but, but whether any of the partners that you're working with have had similar experiences or, or have uh, you know, demonstrated any risk or opportunities to you? From the, 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 organize, the partner organisations within your, your, yeah. uh, you, you know, your, your, the, the third generation yes, project yes. And, and maybe the wider academic uh, arena? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, we work, um, Within the third generation project, we have a, a, a specific way of working, which is we work very much at the grassroots and the, the community level. Um, we um, and so so we we work geographically. We work in, in North America and in um, and in East Africa as well. Um, I mean, what we've um, been noticing, I guess. Um, <coughs> I think I'd probably like to make a point on funding, which picks up on some of the earlier points as well about, about EU funding, because I think, um, you know, for one thing, just within within the academic field, um, you know, it's certainly the case that, um, you know, that in terms of research partnerships that we would have in Europe, um, you know, just just talking purely academically for now, without talking about about other partners, it's very clearly um, the case that um, that there are concerns from European partners about having having UK partners, and it's it, at the head of those bids. I mean, it's very anecdotal, but you know there there are there are concerns. I mean, I think from a, a community perspective, um, I mean, I think it is. I mean, in, in funding terms, it's quite. It's quite clear that 
the way that um, that research is developing, what I think is important, and the way that we work is that it's important to have those collaborations between um, community organisations and um, academia and um, policymakers, practitioners, and so you know it's definitely something that that um, that we are advocating within the third generation project both in terms of the conversations that we want to facilitate and you know to act mm -hmm. as a hub for those for those conversations and, and for research um going forward but also that we would want to be partnering with um you know with community organizations and and with policymakers and practitioners because one of the things that we've we've very much um noticed and it, it happens within um you know, with, it's happened within the Brexit discussions, but it happens more generally as well. Is that often the the lines of of, of communication and um, just even the, the the sort of day to day interactions between those different knowledge sectors mm -hmm. um, are not quite as fruitful as as they could be. Um, and I, th I think that's something that's important um, to think about the opportunities that come from that as well. Yeah, if you think about, on, on the back of Mary Fee's question, if you think about mm -hmm. some of the policy development across, um, you know, a, a social cohesion and, and building capacity in communities, yeah. building resilience, the research and development elements of that mm -hmm. are generally being via our universities working in partnership yeah. with, with other universities. And, and the, then when it comes to organisations like yourself attached to the university as well, mm -hmm. of policy development and yeah. that, that policy becoming Europe-wide, um, that, that, if... You, that, that's, that's essentially funded via Europe in yeah. order for that, that to happen. Yeah. Yeah. If that funding's not there, yeah. has the university sector still got the capacity to, to maintain those networks and to maintain that, 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 that piece of work? Because those pieces of work have changed. They've mm -hmm. changed uh, nations, they've changed policy, mm -hmm. and they've changed um, you know, cultures yeah. uh, for the better in, in many cases, especially when you look at things like domestic violence and human trafficking yeah. and uh, criminal mm -hmm. justice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's many, many mm -hmm. social care, health care, all of these things. How, 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 I, how, do we, how do we make it work? I think, I think there's a, a significant amount of concern. I mean, I think obviously, you know, the... Um, you know the the university sector and Euro European funding is only is only you know part of um, part of you know where they where they get um, f where the university fund um, sector gets gets funding from. But but it is a significant concern. It's a, and it's a significant concern you know right across academic um, disciplines with no real sense yet of what's of what's going to fill that because that's really quite a a significant, um, a significant chunk of funding um, to to fill, and you know, and there are a lot of concerns, and you know, and I, I think it's it's thinking about as well. I mean, that there's obviously going to be um, projects that will continue to be able to go on, but not necessarily then with UK as as lead as lead partners, you know, as, as principals investigators, you know, and that might that might be fine, you know, um, but as well, it just does change the nature. Of that um, of that collaboration um, process, I mean, I think it, you know it's important to say as well that you know in terms of um, in terms of research too, and and thinking about community organisations and working with communities. Just you know, I think it's as well for um, you know for us as 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 academics to be thinking well, what actually does that sector need, and what questions actually do they need asked and you know, do they need to be asked but also as well what knowledge is already there within the sector um, that, um, that that the academics are perhaps not not party to and so that for me is is really important to have that 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 fundamental collaboration between different kinds of knowledges because academic knowledge is certainly not the only one yeah. Thanks very much. But before I uh, bring Gail Ross in with the rest of our questions, has any other colleagues got uh, any questions um, for our panel? No, Gail. Thanks. It's just one, um, just to well, just to wrap up, unless the convener wants to come in at the end. Um, in your opinion, the status of EU nationals at the moment in the UK is quite uncertain. Mm. Do you feel this is a human rights issue? Um. Personally, or profess, I suppose. Actually, yeah. I mean, I think. I mean, I think. Um, 
I mean, I, I, would, I would say it was a, a human rights issue because you have, um, because you have a level of uncertainty um, within, within people's day-to-day -day lives, um, within people's day-to-day -day family lives as well, not, not knowing how that is, is going to move forward. And I mean, I think the, the thing to still say is, of course, that there is still so much uncertainty about what, you know, what the actual outcome is going to be. So, it, so it's, not, it's not fair you know, for me to say, right, that, you know, blanket this is a this is a human rights issue because it might it might whatever comes out of um, negotiations might actually deal with um, what I would see as the human rights dimensions of that but if it was you know a worst case scenario um, you know where um, where there really does feel that, um, that that those rights aren't there then I mean it it has to be because it's it's the right to family life. It's the right to um, you know the right to education. The right you know the, it's it's those sort of it's it's fundamental rights. Um, you know that that again I suppose um, you know when I said when I said before sometimes human rights is you know is seen as you know often a patterns of major abuse and you know and, and of course that, that you know. The, the focus. It's important that, that the focus is there, but there's, there's that sort of daily, um, you know, daily abuses as well. Um, you know, the inability to have um, to have a family life. You know, um, you know what what um, you know what, what Mary mentioned as well. You know, violence against women. You know, that's that's a, a daily abuse. And so I think I think it's it's important to think of those everyday considerations as well about Brexit. Craig, do you have any comment on um, EU nationals either benefiting from or contributing to the third sector? Um, <clears throat> one of the, the areas where you can say that there's a, a specific cohort of, of EU nationals working is in health and social care, um, which has a direct impact, as far as we're concerned, on disability rights and the ability to uh, for those people to realise their rights. Um, I think we approximately there's about 5% um, EU nationals working in health and social care sector. So, even if a you know a, a small percentage of them were to leave, it would have a massive impact on the delivery of health and social care services. Um, it's in, in our evidence, but the House of Lords uh, crossbench peer um, had pointed out that a lot of the personal assistance that um, disabled people rely on are EU nationals as well. So. They provide a lot of services. There's a lot of work in the third sector, but as a specific group, um, a specific cohort, I would say health and social care was an area where there could be challenges if there is changes to their immigration status or people just decide to leave. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I think we've exhausted our questions this morning. Uh, can I thank you both very much for your attendance at committee this morning? And um, David. On ah. that, um, ah. <laughs> sorry, Convener, and uh, good morning, everybody. I uh, hosted on Tuesday night um, in Parliament a Fin Gael, which are a Finnish national staying in um, Scotland. And they were discussing that the possibilities of a two tier system for EU nationals, one living here with different rights to ones who are coming in to support um, sectors <laughs> like the healthcare, but will have totally different rights. Um, do you really think um, that? The human rights issue there is you're going to have two groups of EU nationals who will not benefit from the same sort of things that uh, we have in the UK. Yeah, yeah that's a good one. Um, it depends, I suppose, if it's um, if they are able to enjoy the same rights in terms of access to justice and, and sort of human rights terms, then it'd be less of an issue. I mean, the, the idea is, is unusual, but. I understand that immigration systems can target certain sectors if they have a shortfall. So health and social care may be one of one of those areas. And um, we had received some suggestion that the new Scottish tax code with the S prefix could be used. So there's sufficient, you know, manoeuvrability within immigration systems to to achieve that. But certainly, if if that were to come about, you would expect those people to have the same legal protections and, and human rights protections uh, in the eyes of the law. Their, their argument was um, that once already staying here and had been here for a long while, would still be entitled to all the benefits and all the, whereas 
people coming from the EU after Brexit would have a different entitlement? There's, there's an issue at the moment, actually, with, uh, with uh, the right to remain. The, the Home, Office, Home Office have introduced an 85-page document for people to, to apply for the right to remain, um, which even people that are, are medical doctors are, are struggling with and, and giving up on. Um, it also includes demands for, you know, details about their health insurance, and it's, it's quite a, there's quite a few hoops to jump through. But they've now, uh, dis they're dissuading people from applying for that, saying that they can sign up for email alerts instead. So there's an issue with people that are resident here already who, following Brexit, are, are, may not have the proper documentation to remain. So I think, it's, I think the issue is that the, the Home Office are inundated but it's, it's quite concerning that people are unable to get the, the documentation that they are, are looking for before this all happens. Thank you. You just uh, touched on something that I was thinking about yesterday when I was reading about the Home Office alerts, the news alerts. You could sign up for this news alert. I couldn't find any detail on that about how that data could then be used by the Home Office. Um, and I wonder whether any of your organisations had, had, had uh, picked that up, because I couldn't find any disclaimer to say this was only, your data would only be used for um, the, the, the use of the alerts, or your data would be used in, in a wider context by the Home Office. Yeah, it's something we don't know about either. We only picked up on the, the email alert thing recently, but I'm sure it may be something you would want to check with, okay. with the Home Office. Well. Okay. Thank you. I think we have exhausted our questions now. Yes, uh, we have exhausted it. So thank you so much for your contributions to committee this morning. My usual rider is that if you go away and you think I should have said something, please, please let us know because this is an issue that we will be uh, touching on all o right, right, right through the, the, the process of the negotiations uh, up to and if uh, on Alex's behalf we leave the EU. Um, but again, thank Not you so much. <laughs> well, it's your, it's your question. You stop it. You, you'll stop it. Um, and, and but but th th thank, thank you again. Um, I'm going to suspend committee now uh, to go into private, um, but to allow a quick comfort break as well before we get into private session. Thanks very much.